Hi, my name is Eric Patrick. I'm an associate professor in the radio, television, film department at Northwestern University. Um, I'd like to, I, I just did this lecture and it was twice as long as it needed to be. So I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna be talking with you today uh, about the, the lost art of pra praxis in, uh, in fact, let me back up, lost art of praxis in arts pedagogy. Um, uh, so just to give you a little bit of history here, traditional models of art education prioritize skill instruction, reproducing canonical works, uh, viewing great works and technical proficiency. Uh, but because of the institutionalization of art, there's been a lot of changes in pedagogy. One of those is just a very simple thing that's a holdover from a more agrarian age, which was the time-limited academic terms that we go to school for a certain number of weeks and then we go home uh, to work on the farm initially and now to go have spring break fun or summer, summer fun or go do internships. Uh, uh, there's been an expansion of administration in academia, which has changed, changed the whole model, of course. Uh, a lot more software, hardware, uh, and there's been a sort of social collapse of what we consider the unified canon of works in art. So that's always changing. Uh, obviously, the disappearance of K-12 art education, uh, employment anxiety uh, among students that are getting art education, and this kind of aesthetic divergence where everyone likes what they likes. Um, so... I wanted to talk a little bit about some other aspects of this, uh, one uh, being the sort of persistent myths of individualism in US and indeed Western uh, cultures. There's this idea that we're all totally individual. Uh, there's also these signifiers uh, coming from the world of se semiotics, these sort of signifiers and marketing buckets that we align with. If we wear a certain kind of shoes, if we listen to a certain kind of music, if we like going to museums and what kind of galleries, uh, how we interpret culture and how we interpret ideology has become as much part of a global capitalist system as anything. Uh, there's obviously all kinds of conceptual new media art practices, which is de-emphasized practice and specific skill sets uh, and, and moved more toward a kind of conceptual model. And then of course, everyone has their own aesthetic preferences, which they feel uh, are somehow more or less valued. Um, and increasingly, there's gatekeepers to the tools like Adobe and things like this. And there's these tropes that we see throughout media and art that are used again and again and again, which, uh, which uh, increasingly make them sort of iconic in the way that uh, it's less necessary to be able to actually do them. Very specific skills like perhaps uh, drawing uh, is, is the most obvious. So there are models for praxis across disciplines. Of course, elementary school, so much rote learning. Uh, sports players do it all the time. And music, uh, uh, with uh, when you pick an instrument, it's all about practice. And, and certainly foreign language is one of the areas we've seen really things fall apart. Uh, that there's not been so much success with academic terms. Uh, we see more success in things that uh, require 12 months out of the year of practice, little bits every day, and Duolingo capitalizes on that, the, the company that teaches foreign language. Although being a private enterprise, its real goal is to teach you just enough to where you keep learning, but never so much that you actually learn the language and then you're not a customer anymore. And certain STEM and humanities uh, areas will do this as well. Uh, uh, so for a student to be successful in thinking about this sort of praxis model of learning, uh, and I'll give you uh, a part of that model here in a couple of minutes, um, but some of the student needs for success are obviously humility. Uh, uh, you know, we have to be humble to learn uh, and not just humble to learn, but uh, humble that whatever it is we're learning might not have an immediate uh, status or commodity impact on our life or how we interact with the world. Uh, and that's okay. So every time we come into a situation, a learning situation, it's very important for students to understand that it, it requires uh, humility uh, on everyone's part, really. Uh, and, and, and routine. Uh, a student has to be able to get into a routine of a daily practice. That's really what this is, is a daily practice. It's leveraging uh, the cognitive science and learning design uh, to increase student performance in very specific areas 
of the arts that have been sort of left behind. Frequent assessments, uh, and students can begin to do this on their own uh, in giving themselves assessments uh, uh, as they go. And, and keep in mind, we're, we're trying to build a self-directed practice. So what we want to do with students is lead them to the point where they can assess their own work. They can assess their competencies. And if there are new competencies that they need to build, which is increasingly so in the contemporary era, they will be able to break it down into its component parts and over uh, a period of time, uh, master <clears throat> all of those competencies. Obviously, it takes delayed gratification because this model works best uh, over longer periods of time in shorter intervals. And there has to be sort of a, concep a conceptual shift uh, from the idea that we have some sort of innate talent, which is uh, an unfortunate and persistent sort of myth in art, uh, that, that everything is about some innate and talent, to the idea that we're in a process. And that's why we even see some departments called the Department of Art Practice, that there's a practice that we're engaged in. Um, so I also, if we're talking about student needs, we should also talk about institutional needs for success of, of a model like this. And the most obvious, as I've already mentioned, is rethinking the academic term system. Now that's obviously an uphill climb, uh, but there are other ways we might be able to do that. And in fact, I would think the, that foreign languages might be a natural partner in finding uh, administrative ways of structuring that. There are models sort of out there of uh, of a year long class that you take or something like that, which mu with much less uh, uh, upfront time each week, uh, and then having specific learning objectives. I find in art so much it is uh, uh, as you can see at the bottom there the idea of the sage on the stage. Some great artist or someone that's uh, uh, very notable in art uh, stands and pontificates about people's work. Uh, a lot of times these are very useful critiques and very good critiques, but even that critique process doesn't have like a clear rubric to it often. Um, so, you know, making uh, uh, adjustments to how we assess things, uh, uh, less reliance on grades perhaps or, or completion, uh, but kind of creating a model where there's a learning ladder, if you will. Um, and obviously prioritizing self-reliance that's increasingly difficult in the administrative uh, university system as it exists. Uh, but it's uh, since we do want students to have a self-directed practice, uh, we really want them to be able to to be able to find ways to 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 get to what they want. And there's no better way to empower them to do that than by giving them the actual skills uh, that they need uh, in the arts. Uh, so, some of the big learning design strategies for the arts are that one one skill should be broken into individual competencies, uh, and this is all stuff from learning design, and that and that we all well know. Uh, we maybe don't always practice this, but it's always good to to return to this. So skills should be broken into individual components uh, uh, and co and competencies. Whenever you have something that you're trying to learn, if you have something big like I want to do writing, I want to be a screenwriter, or I want to be a painter or something like that. Well, you have to break that down. And for instance, uh, for screenwriters, you might spend some time working on just dialogue, just working on dialogue, others with exposition, uh, scene, ambience, all kinds of atmosphere, isolating little things to write about, or the same way, even to work on drawing skills, whether it's figure drawing or life drawing or something like this. Uh, it also requires a 15 minute daily interval for each competency. Now, I found that uh, students can actually have uh, really great success with less than 15 minutes uh, a day, uh, but it takes longer. Uh, and often you have to be working with smaller pieces uh, to that. 15 minutes seems to be the sweet spot. Over 15 minutes, and that's when our brain starts to 
uh, fatigue a little, maybe not be as efficient. Uh, a good way of getting around that, because of course I'm not suggesting that uh, art students at a university should only work for 15 minutes a day, uh, but a good way to get a, a, around this sort of brain fatigue uh, and to keep the brain as fresh as possible, we know from learning science also, is that we can switch topics. Uh, so we can work on one competency for 15 minutes and then switch to another competency for 15 minutes and so on. And even work have, have many of these going on uh, uh, for even hours a day. And, I, and I've, uh, I've done this myself as well as assigned it to my students and found uh, great success in doing this. Uh, already seeing success on the quarter system here at Northwestern, which is 10 weeks, uh, or other or or the semester system, but but even more so uh, when they can take it into the summer and take it over the the holidays and that sort of thing. Uh, it also requires kind of a minimum of uh, six days a week. Uh, you can do seven days a week is fine. I've done that and I've had students do it. Six seems ideal because one day is kind of a nice day. For the brain and everything to sort of consolidate these things so having that uh that one day a week uh, uh uh off is good less than six days a week and it starts to just not be enough time to to make the advances um uh you have to balance the difficulty levels in each competency and what i mean by that is that is that it should be hard <laughs> it should be not too hard to where you're going to get frustrated, but hard enough. And we see this in speech therapy and other things that when they're working with a child that has speech deficiencies, they'll make something not too hard uh, uh, where the child gets frustrated, but hard enough where the child has to attend to it and work at it. And then what you see is results happening very quite quickly. In fact, oftentimes within, you know, eight or 10 of these sessions, uh, which might be a 15 minute session working on one thing. Um, so this is a great way to develop skills uh, quickly, actually, uh, in the scope of things, if you think about how long. Uh, in fact, you can even do it within two to four week intervals. I've had students report back to me that after doing this for some time, that they could start working on a competency that they had isolated. Uh, and again, they could break it down into, into starting to see results from it from eight days of practice. Uh, uh, but I would say around two weeks, you notice uh, a difference. And if you don't notice a difference within two weeks, of this sort of 15 minute daily practice, then it probably means that you haven't broken the competency down into the smallest form that it needs to be. Uh, it needs to be small enough, you know, it might be that you're wanting to uh, uh, figure out how to do a rainy day uh, uh, scene that you want to draw, and you might have to break it down and just work on the umbrella first of the people uh, that are walking around and then sort of build out from there. Um, so obviously this kind of approach that is a sort of long-term approach that says we have this daily practice, we get up, we brush our teeth, we, we go, uh, uh, do our drawing and we have our breakfast. You know, if we have this idea of a daily practice, it, it de-emphasizes the product, uh, uh, which is actually good, uh, uh, for the short term anyway, and especially for learning. Uh, and it also de-emphasizes the critical rhetoric uh, surrounding it, which in some cases, especially for very young people that have not read a lot of the critical rhetoric that sort of leads to the, these kinds of uh, uh, critiques in the art world, it can be suffocating and even paralyzing. Uh, so, so it kind of allows students to just work on those skills that are going to serve them well. Uh, now, a really obvious example here is drawing, and that's in my field of I'm an uh, animator by training and, and in the world of uh, animation, uh, but I could apply it to the world of filmmaking, to, to the art world. We could talk about serigraphy. We could talk about uh, 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 clay or pottery or, or all kinds of things. Um, if I was going to do this with drawing and painting and say develop my drawing and painting skills in this model, it would involve me... Um, it would involve me uh, uh, starting with probably cartooning, you know, just cartooning basic forms, understanding basic perspective, 2D perspective, 3D perspective, how that throws shadows based on where the light's at, 
uh, just simple, simple things. Uh, and then that would turn into forms. Then those forms would become not just cubic, but uh, perhaps cylindrical. Uh, and then eventually they would become objects and perhaps also spaces, both interior spaces and exterior spaces. Uh, uh, this would give me a, a lot of work that to, to break these down into little bitty things I'm working on, you know? Uh, and then I could do the same thing with life drawing, with figure drawing, with portraiture. I, in fact, I could even see spending an entire year on each of these things. Uh, but of course, by the time you got to the end of a year uh, with one of these things, you'd have a pretty good handle on it. Uh, in fact, the, the reports that I've got from students of this sort of thing, the ones that really sort of stuck with it, found that if they if they did something uh, like this, a life drawing for a year, that they felt like at the end of one year, they felt like they were 30% of the way to mastery. That doesn't sound like much, but it's actually quite a lot uh, because it means that over the course of a year, they can they can do it. Uh, it's all possible. They aren't fast at it. Uh, they aren't perhaps as clean as they want to be. Uh, it's not as detailed as they want to be, but they're on their way. And they found that that's kind of the, that what it's been. It's about 30% a year, which means after three years, they're very close to, uh, uh, to sort of as high as they possibly could be. Um, so you could do this in any number of areas and you see even medium studies or, or design by breaking these things down. So just to sort of conclude, um, uh, uh, you know, this would involve transitioning from a kind of a cumulative curriculum to a synchronous curriculum, uh, which obviously isn't the easiest thing to do in current academic systems. Uh, but I have seen models of people that work like this that will have uh, a class that goes over a year or a class that goes over a uh, uh, a longer period, like perhaps has a little intro session and then comes back for a class at the end for uh, some kind of alternate credit. I've also seen people do this in extracurricular environments through student groups and things like this that allow a little more uh, 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 wiggle room over over the breaks, uh, but it would it, it would certainly help uh, when you to have some sort of institutional support behind that. Uh, uh, so this would involve like daily practice requirements within current academic structures or uh, uh, beginning competency work uh, in the first year of college. Uh, right now, most students that come into college start taking general education requirements right off the bat. Uh, and I'm sure that's great in a lot of ways, but it really uh, puts them at a disadvantage if they're not towards the end of their sophomore year, really just getting into their degree. Uh, uh, this kind of practice works best uh, if started early to where you do have a sort of four years for mastery uh, uh, in it. Uh, and you, again, you can work at multiple of these at one time. Um, this also, it, there's a sort of scalability to it, as I said, that you can use it for multiple skills, multiple competencies. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of options uh, for that. Uh, and again, we're it, just to, I, I don't want to drive on this too much, but this idea that that we want to create students that uh, have a self-directed practice. And whether that self-directed practice is in exhibiting their own work in galleries uh, or selling their work at art festivals, uh, which might involve all kinds of competencies related to uh, to business or even uh, grant writing and residencies. Uh, but we also will have students that we want to go into advertising uh, or other kinds of commercial fields, perhaps in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and again, these kinds of competencies that aren't taught so much in the modern art world anymore uh, could be could be quite useful for students uh, in in terms of helping them. Uh, of course, this is going to involve a kind of faculty agreement on the specific degree competencies. And I think perhaps that's one of the problems is that in our in our 
current culture, we we don't agree on what art means or what the competencies are. We often say very vague things that don't have any specificity about that we want people to be able to think critically uh, uh, or create critically, uh, which, which really doesn't amount to anything uh, unless you sort of unpack what that means. Uh, but if we're in an art department, uh, traditionally a studio art major would be a major where you would understand uh, basic representation skills as well as uh, uh, non-representational skills, uh, studies in various kinds of mediums, uh, studies in uh, other things uh, other than just sort of computer tutorials, which sort of simplify the process uh, in a way that's not always helpful. Okay, so that's uh, that's my uh, uh, that's my speech, and please uh, note my email address. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you.